My name is Nirav Shaw, the Director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Lambrew, Commissioner of Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Lambrew and I are delighted to be able to join everyone today to provide an update on where we stand with respect to COVID-19 for today, Wednesday, December 30th, 2020. I'll start by providing an update on where we stand epidemiologically and otherwise, and then turn things over to Commissioner Lambrew. And I begin my update on an unfortunate and sad note. Maine CDC has received the report of another individual who has passed away with COVID-19. He was a man in his 80s from York County. And his passing marks the 334th death associated with COVID-19 since we began. I'd like to take a second as we, are, as we are now at the end of the year, to acknowledge those 334 families who will be entering the new year without the loved one that they lost this year to COVID-19. I'd like to take a second to acknowledge that loss and offer our deepest condolences to all 334 families. Their loss is not just theirs, but our entire community's loss, a collective loss that each and every one of us feels and shares in the grief of. I'd like to take a second to offer a moment of memorial to each and every one of the 334 individuals who have lost their lives in Maine this year to COVID-19. Overall, across the state, there are a total of 23,499 cases of COVID-19 an increase of 590 cases since yesterday. Of those, 20,064 are confirmed cases, an increase of 482, and 3,435 are probable cases, an increase of 108 probables. Overall, cumulatively, 1,039 individuals have been hospitalized, and just in the past 30 days alone, 305 people have been hospitalized. Right now in Maine, 177 people are in the hospital with COVID-19. 48 of them are in the intensive care unit and 19 of them are on a ventilator. As I mentioned a moment ago, there have been a total of 334 deaths among individuals with COVID-19 across the state. And among all of our cases, 2,535 have been among healthcare workers. I'd like to take a moment next to talk about one outbreak that Maine CDC opened just yesterday. And that is an outbreak at the Kennebunk Center for Health and Rehabilitation, where we are aware of 38 total cases, approximately 34 among residents and four among staff. Maine CDC recently became aware of the situation and we had a call with the leadership of that facility yesterday to talk about the things that we offer in, in outbreak situations, assistance with respect to testing, PPE, infection control, and staffing. We will keep everyone updated as we learn more about this outbreak investigation and as we continue to work with the facility. I'd also like to take a second to talk about where we stand with respect to testing. Right now in Maine, our seven day PCR positivity rate, test positivity rate, now stands at 5.43%. And our testing volume stands at 460 tests for every 100,000. The numbers with respect to antigen testing are in parallel. The seven day antigen testing positivity rate now stands at 5.64% and the volume of antigen tests being conducted is at 168 per, per every 100,000. To put that number in perspective, especially the PCR positivity rate, one week, ago, I'm sorry, one incubation period ago, so approximately two weeks ago, the PCR positivity rate across the state was 4.6%. 
Today, it stands at 5.4%. Some things have changed during that time, for example, with respect to testing volume, but other things have not changed, for example, with respect to the high number of hospitalizations. There is, reason, there is good reason to believe that a large portion of the increase in positivity rates over the past two weeks is in part because of increased as well as increasing transmission of COVID-19 across Maine. There are other factors as well, for example, changes in testing volume. But these positivity rates, coupled with the hospitalizations, as well as sadly with the number of deaths, suggests that what we have talked about for many weeks now is continuing across Maine, which is to say, increased and increasing levels of transmission statewide. We'll have more to talk about, about that in just a bit. Because next I'd like to talk about where we stand with respect to vaccines. Yes, or cumulatively, 23,527 doses of COVID-19 have now been administered across the state. I'd like to too put that number in perspective. As of today, there have been more people vaccinated for COVID-19 in Maine than who have had COVID-19 in Maine. Again, a total of 23,527 doses administered and a total of 23,499 total cases. There is still, of course, a long road ahead of us with respect to COVID-19, but we are continuing our work around vaccination and will continue to do so. One final note with respect to where we stand with vaccines and vaccinations. Last week, I mentioned the occurrence of an adverse event that had occurred in an individual healthcare worker who had received a dose of the Pfizer vaccine. Since that time, Maine CDC has received the reports of three additional individuals who have had allergic reactions following receipt of their first dose of vaccine. That brings the total number of allergic reactions in Maine to now four out of 23,527. Of those four, two were among individuals who received the Pfizer vaccine, two were among individuals who received the Moderna vaccine. They were of varying degrees of severity. All four individuals recovered and are doing just fine. All four instances were immediately reported to Maine CDC as well as to the US CDC. And all four occurrences were detected because of the monitoring system that providers who are administering vaccines on the ground have put into place. That is to say, looking after folks for at least 15 and in some cases 30 minutes after they receive the vaccine to make sure they are doing well. The bottom line here is that though these reactions can and will occur, there is a system in place to detect them quickly and to take action upon them and to report them to Maine CDC as well as to the US CDC. Reactions to any kind of medication, whether it's penicillin or the new COVID vaccine, can and will occur. What gives me confidence in the vaccine as well as in the system is that we are aware of these, we are receiving reports of them, and the system to monitor for them, find them, and take action upon them is working as intended. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to Commissioner Lambert. Thank you. Today, the Maine Department of Health and Human Services is announcing $5.2 million in grants to 54 healthcare organizations to help sustain vital services during the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> the Maine Healthcare Financial Relief Program is backed by the federal CARES Act Coronavirus Relief Fund. It provides up to $100,000 in financial relief to healthcare organizations to address business disruptions due to the pandemic. It is modeled on the Maine Department of Economic and Community Development's Maine Economic Recovery Grant Program. The bulk of funding was awarded to Maine hospitals and nursing homes, with grants also received by providers of children's behavioral health, home health, and hospice. These grants offer new immediate relief for nursing facilities, hospitals, and others that are providing vital care throughout Maine. The grants build on the department's commitment to support Maine providers in response to the pandemic. We have provided more than $57 million in federal and state 
scholars to main care providers and have supported these facilities in COVID-19 testing. Main health care providers have also received direct support of nearly $500 million from the Provider Relief Fund directly administered by the federal government. Additionally, some providers were eligible for previous rounds of the DECD's main economic recovery grant program, which in total provided $235 million to 5,294 businesses and nonprofits across the state of Maine. We thank those providers for their hard work during this pandemic, and we look forward to working with them on administering more dollars that will soon be coming from the federal government. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Shaw. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we will now turn to our colleagues over in the media. And uh, the first question for the afternoon goes to Bob Evans at News Center. Hey, Bob, I will, I will turn to you. Sorry about that. You got me now? Yep, go ahead. Um, Dr. Shaw, is the main CDC tracking the progress of vaccinations for first responders in York County? And is it the same for all counties? Uh, sorry, Bob, I, let, let, me, let me start at a, a higher level. We are tracking the progress of vaccines that have been administered to first responders, specifically right now, that is EMS clinicians. Uh, you're asking specific to York County. Uh, we, we can get that information for you. I don't have it at my fingertips, but that information, by, thanks to our colleagues at the Maine EMS program, is being collected. So we do have those data. I don't have it at my fingertips, though. Understood. Um, another question I have is um, the Maine Medical Association has, has been pretty vocal about issues surrounding independent doctors outside of large health organizations um, having access to the vaccine. Have you heard this and could they have been forgotten in the rollout process? No, let me, let me start where you ended, Bob. And, and first of all, we, we have heard their, their concerns and we have met specifically with the Maine Medical Association to talk about ways that we can furnish vaccine to their members. But let me, let me start where you picked, or you, where you left off, Bob which is the notion that independent medical providers may have been forgotten about. That is categorically not the case. What we've talked about for several weeks now is a vaccination plan that started with in-hospital providers at the nucleus, and then moving from there in concentric circles to not just uh, emergency department and ICU providers, for example, but other hospital staff those who are elsewhere in the hospital, those who are providing food service, who are providing janitorial service across the hospital systems. And then from there, moving yet one more circle outward to others, for example, those who are in outpatient practices, outpatient providers who may not be attached to hospitals. The question with respect to those providers is not whether or if they will get vaccinated, but when and how. And we are working through the plan that we've talked about for several weeks now, making sure that vaccine has been furnished to hospital providers and having made inroads against that, now working toward how we can vaccinate those independent providers. I think it's important to note in all of this, Bob, as Commissioner Lambrew and I have talked about, Maine has not received the allocations of vaccine that we initially thought we would. And that has made this vaccine an even more precious commodity than it was even conceived to be a few weeks ago. Independent medical providers will certainly be vaccinated. The question now is how we furnish vaccine to them in a manner that can accommodate the high throughput and make sure they can all get vaccinated as quickly as possible. We hear their concerns. They are squarely in line. It's just a matter of getting them through the process now. Commissioner? I'll just add two points. Hearing, knowing that this is part of our 1A category, we began this week working with hospitals and independent practices to begin to move vaccines to start that process. We are approaching our week four allocation and we expect to be able to do even more of that in the coming week. Um, I have another question for the commissioner, if I may. Um, commissioner, when someone needs a test, um, the patients are asked if they have symptoms or not. We are told that patients without symptoms 
tests are being paid for by the state. One, is that correct? How much per test? And do you have any idea how much this is adding up to the bus cost? Sure. So I want to separate out the whether or not we pay for it based on symptoms versus whether we whether or not we pay for it depending on the site. We have uh, almost 30 swab and sends. These are state sponsored sites across the state of Maine that provide at no cost to individuals a PCR test, that more thorough test that Dr. Shaw has previously talked about to people in Maine without a doctor referral at no cost to them. We are funding that through funds that we've gotten from the federal government and we will continue to do that going forward. We also, at Walgreens sites throughout the state, offer tests called Buy Next Now tests that are also free at no charge to individuals for people who do have symptoms or who are close contacts of people with COVID-19 who can get that test repeatedly, which lets them go back to an essential job, for example. Those two types of tests are provided via state funds, excuse me, federal funds through the state. But it's important to note that the federal government has also directed private insurance, Medicare and Medicaid to pay for COVID-19 tests as well. So sometimes there are charges that people get when they go to different sites for COVID-19 testing. That's often due to other services, for example, a consult with a physician or a secondary test. But if you go to one of the sites on the Keep Maine Healthy website, where it's called the Swab and Send, or one of our state-sponsored Walgreens Now by next testing, there is no charge to Maine residents. Thank you, that's very helpful. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Morgan at WABI next. Hi, Dr. Shaw and Commissioner Lambrew. Um, my first question is about the second dose of vaccines uh, for people that have already had them. Um, just wondering how that works, if that's coming up, if you have those doses here, and if anything on the federal level, a level is affecting here on a state level. Sure, Morgan. So the second doses of, okay, I'm, there's gonna be a lot of I'm going to try to be really clear, but there, the, 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 the numbers and weeks get, they get convoluted fast. So I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to try to be uh, as precise as I can around this. The second doses for the Pfizer vaccine that was delivered to Maine on week one will be arriving in Maine next week. All right. So of the 12,675 doses, a Pfizer vaccine that Maine received the first week, that was the week of December 14th, the second doses for those 12,675 doses are set to arrive in Maine next week. They will be delivered to the same locations that received the first allocations so that those locations can furnish those recipients with their second dose at, 20, at 21 days after receipt of the first dose. Uh, Morgan, did that, does that all square? Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, my um, other question is about you, Maine, hosting a basketball game um, coming up this weekend. Just wondering what uh, work was put into that to, to have that event possible, be made possible. I'll answer that. We have been asked by the University of Maine system about our protocols when it comes to indoor gatherings, for example, which do apply across the board. So they have assured us that they can have that basketball game and adhere to the 50 person gathering limit that is statewide. We also have said previously that intercollegiate athletics, professional sports are typically subject to the guidelines that are issued by different types of leagues. They tend to have more access to testing, for example, other types of protocols. So they are following, as our understanding, as is my understanding that they're following the intercollegiate guidelines for that activity. But our understanding is they are in compliance with our main guidelines. Thank you very much. Morgan, one last note on the second dose. When we talk about the allocations that we are receiving uh, in, in week X and not it not being what we thought we were going to receive, that only it discusses and accounts for the first doses those second doses are being held in reserve by Operation Warp Speed. And so when we talk about X number of thousand doses heading to Maine for whatever week, those are just those first doses. 
we are not expected to hold half of those in reserve for the allotted time. They are kept and, and shipped to us during the week that they would be needed. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Amy Brown next. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Is anyone in Maine studying the variants of the virus that are present here? Um, yes. So ever since we began working on COVID-19 testing way back in February, uh, or shortly, shortly thereafter, I should say, we uh, entered into a partnership with our colleagues at the Jackson Laboratory. They have the interest and the capability to study the various variations of viruses that exist all around us, whether it's COVID and others. So from time to time, Maine sends samples of the positive tests that we conduct at our laboratory here in Augusta to our colleagues at the Jackson Laboratory. We do the same with samples that we also send to the US CDC to conduct that same degree of analysis. We are on the lookout for any and all emerging variants. Of course, top of mind for all of us right now is the variant that has emerged in the UK and a, and a similar one in South Africa. As of when I spoke or communicated with one of our chief scientists at the laboratory yesterday, the, the main CDC laboratory, that new variant had not yet been detected. As, as you and perhaps many viewers are aware, the state of Colorado did report detecting it. We have not detected it here, but the bottom line is that we are on the lookout for it. Great, thank you. And regarding the second doses, I have two questions. Uh, will people who have had an allergic reaction to the first dose be able to receive a second dose? And also, what if the second doses don't arrive in time? Is there a window that people have if they don't get it right within two weeks? Sure. So Amy, let me answer your first question. The current recommendation from the US CDC, uh, coming all the way from their deputy director of infectious diseases, is that individuals who have serious allergic reactions to the first dose forego the second dose. Now, there's obviously a lot of clinical judgment that comes into whether, an, or whether a reaction was serious or non-serious. And that ultimately is up to the clinician, the allergist or immunologist, as well as the person themselves. Um, but the recommendation right now is for those who have received it, who have experienced a serious reaction to forego the second dose. And that's now, with, CDC, what's US that, Amy? CDC, that's US CDC recommendation? That, that is from the US CDC, that's right. And, and we, we concur with that, recognizing that there are varying degrees of seriousness. Um, now, with respect to your second question, that's a concern. Uh, Commissioner Lambrew and I have talked about these second doses. And as I've said before, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, I've, I've, I've had the privilege of being on phone calls with General Perna, uh, who has assured us that the second doses are being earmarked and will be delivered. But as with so many things, until they have arrived in Maine at the places they are supposed to be, we will keep pushing to make sure they are coming on the way they will. All that being said, Amy, the US CDC has also talked about the timing of the second dose. And um, I won't go into too much, but other than to say that the timing is important, uh, the 21 day is a very strong recommendation, but they've also acknowledged that if it's day 22, for example, then that vaccine, the second dose, still will have the boosting efficacy that it that is intended to have. But not much, much outside of that three week range. Well, we, we don't know because the clinical trials that were done really kept the vaccine within a tight window. The purpose of the second dose is to boost the efficacy of the first dose, not so much to continue it, but to boost it and keep the duration of that immune protection as strong as possible for the longer haul. Um, and so I, I won't go into it too much today, but suffice it to say that that's on our mind. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn next to Kelly O'Mara at WAGM. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, the first question is on the CDC website, Arusa County currently has four deaths listed, but since mid-December, three long care term care centers in the county have reported multiple deaths connected to their COVID outbreaks at their facilities. Um, why is it taking so long to show up in the data? And is it possible that some of those deaths will, will be ruled not COVID related in the end? Sure. So Kelly, the first thing is that there, there may be a time between when a facility announces to the public or to families that one of their residents has died with COVID versus when they file an official report with the main CDC 
And then when we review that report, confirm it, and then put it on our website. That process can take just the process of filing the report with Maine CDC can sometimes take facilities three, four, five days, especially given the facilities that we're talking about, many of which are in the midst of an outbreak. So it may take them several days. We've seen it in some cases up to two weeks after a facility has experienced a death where they filed a report with Maine CDC. And then after that, again, we take a day, a half day to review it, make sure it squares with our records, and then we put it on the website. Based on what I've been told uh, and based on the data and conversations that we've, I've had with my team, we are aware of at least seven total deaths in Aroostook County just in the past week associated with nursing homes. Not all of those have been officially reported to Maine CDC, and that's why you don't see them on our website yet. Okay, and my second question is kind of along the same line. Some of the long-term care facilities in the county are reporting a large number of cases among employees. Um, are you concerned that there won't be enough staff left to take care of patients, and is the state offering any kind of assistance to these facilities struggling with the staffing numbers? The answer to both of those is yes. Let's start with the concern. Our concern level is high uh, with respect to what's happening in Aroostook County right now, particularly in, in three nursing facilities in particular, Highview in, Matawa in, in Matawaska, Mercy Home in Eagle Lake, and Caribou Nursing and Rehab. Uh, our concern level for all three of those facilities is high. Just in those facilities, as you noted, we're aware of a high number of employee cases, at least 14 cases at Highview, at least nine cases at Mercy Home, and at least 27 cases at Caribou Nursing and Rehab, perhaps even higher by the time that this conference is done today because testing is ongoing. One of the things that we do when we open an investigation, is we really what that entails is opening up a direct, frequent line of communication between Maine CDC and the facility itself. We talk about a lot of things, testing, PPE, infection control, but one of the key things that we've talked about with facilities most recently is staffing. We actually have a designated point person whose entire job right now is to help facilities who are experiencing staffing challenges find additional resources. Sometimes that's from temporary agencies, Sometimes that's from other corporate partners, but we've got a person who's, whose job right now is to help facilities experiencing outbreaks navigate staffing. This remains a concern for us, particularly in places like the county, where the number of available staff may not be what it is elsewhere in the state. I'll add that we hey, did you. early in the pandemic create issue emergency rule, rules, which we finalized, because it really is important that nursing facilities do have a plan though a backup plan should they have staff that are sick due to COVID-19 or any other infectious disease. So we are working both to support those nursing facilities, but also to give them the tools so that they can themselves figure out those staffing plans. We appreciate the challenge. We're there for them, but we also are working to make that be a more self-sustaining process. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. I'm gonna turn over to Kevin Miller next. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shaw. Uh, so uh, several states now have decided to not follow the uh, federal advisory committee's guidelines when it comes to uh, Texas and Florida in particular, uh, when it comes to vaccinating essential frontline workers like grocery store clerks and, and postal, postal workers, and instead saying, no, they're going to give these vaccines to older residents. I know, you know we've talked about this with you in the, in the past, um, but given the developments in other states, can you talk at all about, is that something that Maine is considering kind of going your separate way from the federal government, given our, our large population of, of older residents? You know, um, Kevin, I'm certainly aware of the decisions that at least those two states and some others are considering. Uh, in fact, just yesterday evening, I had the opportunity to chat with my counterparts in both of the two states you mentioned to ask them some of the reasons why they went in that direction. Much of what I heard was actually operational. It had to do a lot with the massive size of those states and the challenges in operationalizing something that is more standards-based as opposed to bright line rule-based. Uh, Commissioner Lambrew and I have talked about this uh, extensively. Uh, I don't know that we've made a final decision. Um, we do not have the same operational challenges that a state like Texas or Florida might, uh, meaning we've got a great partnership 
with hospitals, with healthcare providers, uh, with pharmacies. Um, so we don't have those distinct operational challenges. We're also aware that there are equity trade-offs in going in that direction based on the composition of who, for example, is 75 and over versus the composition of who is a frontline worker. And so that's an equity trade-off that is something that we have to discuss and make sure we fully understand. Um, I don't know that there's been a final decision. Right now, we're still razor focused on 1A and making sure healthcare providers of all stripes under the ACIP definition can get vaccinated. But we know that's a decision. We know that those other states have gone in that route. Um, I think there's more discussion to be had. Commissioner? I don't think I have anything to add. We are looking at all different models from all different states, getting those lessons learned and working with the governor and others to figure out our plan going forward. Mm -hmm. And just as a, a follow-up to that, because you know, I'm, we've been getting a lot of, I'm sure all of us in this call has been getting a lot of questions along these lines, and I'm sure your offices have as well, from especially older Mainers. I mean, can you, can you talk a little bit from your points of view, what's the value in, making, in vaccinating, say, a, a young, healthy 20-some-year-old who works in a grocery store, giving them a vaccine before someone who's 70 years old and is obviously at a higher risk of complications? Yep. So let me, let me start with one note, Kevin, uh, which is one of the things that emerged, particularly as I was hearing my counterpart from Florida, Dr. Scott Rivkes, uh, discuss this last night, was the, the, the notion that they were not able to operationalize both simultaneously because of concerns around throughput, sites of vaccination, a number of things. And so they were faced with a rather stark choice of having to choose one or the other. And I don't know that that is necessarily the case in a number of other states. I don't know that it's the case in Maine. But what was really motivating them, at least in Florida, was having to make this difficult decision. Rather than doing both and, they had to do one or the other. The trade-off, according to the US CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, when they were constructing these recommendations, uh, I'm going to talk about this, recognizing that it sounds very sterile. And I'm going to be talking about terms that in the abstract are, are very harsh, but it, it is the data. The trade-off is that younger individuals, such as the grocery store individuals that you mentioned, come into contact with strangers on a more daily basis and more recently thus have had higher rates of disease. That means that they may be out of work and that means they may go on to infect others. So they have higher rates of disease. Older individuals, although they may have higher ra lower rates of disease, have higher deaths as a result. The motivation behind ASIP using both as part of phase 1B was to simultaneously reduce the number of cases of COVID by working to vaccinate frontline workers, as well as reducing the number of deaths associated with COVID by working to vaccinate those 75 and over. Florida had a difficult decision to make. They could really felt they felt like they could only choose one or the other. It's not clear in Maine that we will face that Hobson's choice. Great, and then just one last quick question. Again, uh, getting lots of questions from people, um, especially the older older folks. You know, sixty five and older or seventy five and older. Or is it going to be basically the their personal care physicians, their doctors, who let them know when they're eligible to uh, sign up for vaccine, or is there anything else in the works at your level about making sure these people know when they can come in and get get a vaccine or sign up for one? Yep, um, Kevin, I, I again, I don't want to say for sure what the notification mechanism will be, but for folks 65, 75 and older, it will most likely be communication they receive from their health care provider. Um, for, for a number of reasons, it, it may be preferable, and this is again partly based on what some of my counterparts and I discussed last night, for a number of reasons, operational as well as medical epidemiological, it may be preferred for folks who are 65, 75 and older to receive their vaccine more in the setting of their primary care physician, whereas other individuals who are frontline workers may receive the vaccine as part of their workplace and thus be notified about it by their workplace. Thank you. Yep, uh, I'm gonna turn next to Caitlin Andrews. 
Good afternoon, Dr. Shaw, Commissioner Lambrew. Um, I have a qu two questions. One is kind of in the similar vein um, with what Kevin was asking. Um, you know, I was listening to you talk on Monday, and it sounds like you have an idea roughly of when oh, we expect like dentists might be able to be vaccinated. You know, it seems like you have like a rough idea of when you think these folks might be there. Um, why not publish a timeline or like have something that's more formalized that kind of explains where these people are going to fall, at least like tentatively? Sure. Well, I think it's the word you ended with, which is all of this is tentative. Um, we have still not received the amount of vaccine, for example, that we were told even just a few weeks ago that we could expect. For example, the federal government noted, indicated that they would be sending out 20 million doses across the country by the close of business tomorrow. Um, from what I understand, they're not near that. So part of the, the hesitation, as it were, Caitlin, in publishing a, an ex, even, a, even a broad strokes timeline is that a timeline doesn't mean anything unless there's the concomitant supply to match that. All that being said, we think that tomorrow, having had discussions today and having received input from a number of different groups, we think that tomorrow or very soon we'll be able to, for example, provide more clarity around when independent providers, those who are not part of any hospital ecosystem, may be able to receive vaccine. Okay, thank you. And then my um, second question is, um, so nearly half of Maine's uh, COVID outbreaks in long-term care facilities have been reported in the last two months. Um, and some of those have been the largest and deadliest in the pandemic so far. Um, why do you think those areas are still experiencing these large outbreaks after so many months of learning to control the virus? And do you think part of that struggle could be related to some of those mutations of viruses that spread more easily? Yep. Let me let me start with the latter piece, um, which is I don't have any scientific basis right now to suggest that the number of cases or the number of outbreaks is related to any different type of mutation, be it the one from the UK one from South Africa or any other type. It's a possibility, but without any scientific evidence, it's just a hypothesis. We are again, as I, as I mentioned uh, to Amy earlier, working with the Jackson Laboratories and the US CDC uh, to sequence the most recent findings of the virus. It's possible that we will find as Colorado did that the virus is already here. I think we should all also assume that viruses doing what viruses do that these new variants are likely to arrive in Maine in the near future. Now, with respect to what that means for nursing home outbreaks, um, I think there's a, a few things going on there, Caitlin. Uh, much of what we've seen with nursing home outbreaks, especially recently, but even reaching back to April and May, is that they are, almost, uh, they are often a direct function of community transmission. Where there are high rates of community transmission, there are likely to be outbreaks in nursing facilities. And where there are increasing rates, for example, in Aroostook County, we anticipate seeing more. And so I think what this tells me is just how insidious the virus is. Uh, even in highly controlled situations where PPE is commonplace, where infection control is the norm, outbreaks have still happened within nursing facilities. It's just an indication of how difficult this virus is to control and why it's all the more important for the rest of us to take steps. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn over to Patty White at Maine Public next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, you've talked before about how we need funding to uh, roll out the vaccine as quickly and efficiently as possible. It sounds like funding is gonna be on the way because of the stimulus bill, but you know, as we move beyond hospitals where um, they've kind of been in charge of logistics and staffing those with volunteers. Can you give us a sense of what your vision is for where vaccinations will happen, you know, what infrastructure is needed and what kind of funding we need, how much? Sure. I'll start with kind of the what, and then um, I'll invite Commissioner Lambrew to talk about the funding and the nuances there. So, Patty, um, if you take a look at what we might need, to achieve widespread coverage of vaccination across the state of Maine, the numbers become pretty stark pretty quickly. That is to say, with 1.3, you know, 1,344,000 people needing to vaccinate everyone twice, two shots in everyone's arm, in the ideal world, 
uh, and be needing to do that in as short of order as possible so we can return to that normalcy we're all looking at and hoping for. What emerges is the need to have extremely high throughput and to start doing so as soon as the supply of vaccine it, it increases to a certain threshold where we can start pushing it out. The way that we will achieve that is through all of the options working in parallel. That is to say, fully activating our partners at the hospitals to work with them to keep the infrastructure that they've already developed over the past two, three weeks um, to keep that open at, where possible for, for example, their patients and others in their community, but simultaneously working with primary care offices to set up vaccines for their panels of patients. It will also entail working with commercial pharmacies who are places that many of us already go to for things like our flu shots. Perhaps they will be able to help us with respect to COVID. Actually, on another call I was on yesterday evening, we started having discussions with Walgreens and CVS about rolling that out as well across the state. But there may be also a need for even larger, more consolidated areas where people can go and receive vaccine and then be monitored for the requisite period of time in, in areas where we can do so in very, very high volume, very high throughput. Those plans are under discussion right now and no final decisions about how, where, and what those might look like to say nothing about the funding and the staffing of them. But right now our focus is trying to figure out what kind of throughput we need to achieve week on week and then building a system that will get us there. And on the sources of funding, we are grateful to Senators King and Collins who helped forge the, the coronavirus relief package that finally got passed. The rest of our delegation supported it as well. We know that there is funding for COVID response, testing, contact tracing, and vaccine distribution, but we don't yet know how much of those resources will come to Maine. We will get, we look forward to, to learning about that amount. We will use it wisely, but we still um, as Dr. Dr. Shah said, need to see what we're getting. You know, we've been getting less vaccine than we were told. We still haven't gotten all the Binex Now tests that the federal government promised to us back in September. And we will continue to act and implement our vaccine program to the best of our ability. We do hope though that sooner than later, those resources will come, which will allow us to catalyze and accelerate our education and vaccination process. Do you even have a bottom sort of amount that you know that the state needs to really do this efficiently? You know, From a funding well, perspective or a throughput perspective? A funding perspective. Okay. I'll just say we'll get it done as, as much as possible. This is a priority for Governor Mills. It's a priority for us. We will vaccinate people as much as possible with the resources that we have. The more resources we have, the more we can, again, accelerate that throughput increase our education, recruit more staff to help vaccinate people, and get more systems to be able to bring people in when they may have trouble accessing a particular site or a particular doctor. So it will absolutely make it easier to get from where we are now to where we want to be is ultimately vaccinating every eligible person in Maine, but we will do our best no matter what. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Patty. Uh, I'm going to turn over to Allison Ross next. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thanks so much for taking my question. Just one today. So will we ever get to the point where people can have the option to pick whichever vaccine they prefer? Say they prefer the Pfizer vaccine or they prefer the Moderna vaccine. I know they have said that some vaccines are better for other populations, but do you think that could be in our future? Sure, so first of all, Allison, right now, based on the data on the two vaccines that have been authorized in the United States, as well as the, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine that just recently got authorized in the UK, there aren't really strong differences in terms of which vaccine is preferable for different subgroups, for example, especially as between the two that we've got in the US, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine. They are nearly identical in every way, down to the way they work. Now, that may change uh, as more and different vaccines become authorized or approved. But to the question you asked, will folks get a choice? It's really too early to know. We are several, several months away from the supply of vaccine being so great that choice becomes an option. The other thing to think about is that for the most part, folks don't generally 
exert or, or express preferences among their vaccine choices. I don't know about you, but when I go to get my flu shot, I don't usually specify which manufacturer's flu shot uh, I'm asking for. The same with other vaccines that I may get, let alone antibiotics that I may get from my physician. Generally speaking, my preference when I get my flu shot is to get the flu shot that is the closest to my arm, no matter where that is. That is my advice for everybody right now and probably for the foreseeable future with respect to the COVID vaccine. The best COVID vaccine for you is the one that is the closest to your arm right now. If we ever get into a world where choices become a possibility, that's something we can revisit. But also keep in mind, Allison, that there is an operational efficiency to one site using one vaccine so that every single person who goes, as well as the site that's administering it, knows exactly when to send people back for their second dose. And if folks have to start making calculations about okay, you come back on day 21, oh, you want the other one that's 28, oh, you want this one that's 30, there's the possibility for errors to happen. So there's a lot of benefit to having sites administer a particular vaccine. That's not to say that there won't ever be choices, but we really have to think hard about what those choices mean. Certainly, if data emerge for some vaccines to suggest that they are better in certain subgroups, then those will be clinically indicated. That won't be so much a matter of preference, That'll be a matter of clinical judgment, though. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And to round us out for the afternoon, I'm going to turn things over to Mal Meyer. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, I'm interested in um, the outbreak that was reported. You said that there were 38 total cases uh, break, broken down to 34 residents and four staff. But you mentioned this was only reported yesterday. That seems like a lot of cases. To, uh, when was that reported then? I know it was, I'm not sure when it was reported. It was opened yesterday by Maine CDC and a call was had with the facility. Uh, based on what I understand, um, they, the facility did a round of testing not long ago where they detected one or two cases. And as per protocol, anytime a facility does a round of testing where at least one case is detected, they immediately revert and do a, a round of universal testing across the facility. And it was during that subsequent round of universal testing where these higher numbers were detected. Again, this 38, as you noted, 34 residents, four staff members. Um, I'm not sure when that was reported to us, but it was opened officially yesterday. Um, and then uh, a follow-up, what is being done then from a state level to, to help them get this outbreak under control? Um, mm -hmm. Are you sending in staff there to help them? What's being done? Sure. So the general approach to any type of outbreak situation at a long-term care facility involves four modes, four concepts, or four work streams uh, of operation. Number one is support for, your, for subsequent rounds of testing. Facilities across Maine, all types of long-term care facilities, are already engaging in different types of testing based on where they are, et cetera. But now that they flipped into an outbreak mode, the frequency of that testing has increased. We support them by providing them swabs, transport media, as well as making our laboratory available to them so they can get quick turnaround. Number two, we check in with them on PPE. Does every single staff member there have PPE? Is every single staff member ta uh, fit tested? If they aren't, we help them with that. Number three, infection control. We do a deep dive, a deep review of all of their infection control practices. Our staff shared among facilities, for example, are those who are at higher risk cordoned off so they are uh, less likely to infect others. So infection control is number three. And number four is staffing. We work with the facility to assess whether they have concerns about their future staffing needs. We raised that specifically with this facility yesterday. And to the extent that they do, we offer to connect them with staffing agencies and other resources. Is there any long-term um, concerns that you have for this facility um, in, the, in the days and weeks ahead that you have? What we do in any outbreak is, is first try to focus on getting a handle on what's going on, and then, of course, start planning for the future. Um, what we've seen through our work with numerous facilities is that with the dedication that they've shown, we can help them get a lid on what's happening, try to reduce the number of new cases that occur by limiting opportunities for the virus to spread, all of which, of course, helps the facility return to normal. We've seen facilities who have grappled with outbreaks for long periods of time, but even in those, 
they've been able to get a handle on things and get their facilities back on solid footing. It remains a concern. It's one reason I wanted to talk about it today, given the number. Um, but we are we are working very, very ardently with them. And my last question, sorry, real quick, is this the largest outbreak that you've been able to identify then for the pandemic in this type of facility? Uh, no, we've, uh, sad to say, we've had outbreaks at long-term care facilities that have been larger in size. Uh, now, some of those have been in larger facilities. Uh, so, for example, this facility has 58 residents, from what I've been told, and approximately 100 staff. That makes it a sizable facility. But sad to say, there have been outbreaks in Maine that have been numerically larger. I don't have a sense of, on a percentage basis, where this one falls. This one is significant, but there have been others that have been of the same caliber, same, same degree of concern, same magnitude. Uh, before we adjourn for the afternoon, I, I wanted to take a second and just reflect on the past year. The next time we all meet as a group, it will be a brand new year. Uh, when we first started these meetings way back in February, Little could any of us have known what the rest of 2020 would have in store. We were so young back then, and we all had the shorter hair to show it. And as we all know now, things have changed considerably since February. There are, there are certain years in history that are so eventful that they are regarded on their own as turning points in history. Years where the weight of the moment overwhelmed everything else that was going on. These are years where wars began or ended, or years when deep societal rifts bubbled to the surface, or years when pandemics took hold. Years like 1865, 1918, 1945, 1968, just to name a few. 2020 will no doubt join that list. It will go down in history as a year known by just those four digits alone. As we've all seen this year, the pandemic has ushered in new ways of living, working, feeling, and going about our daily lives. And though we've all been physically distant, we have in some ways become culturally closer this year as a result of our collective shared experiences trying to find lights in the dark of this pandemic. Even beyond the pandemic itself, as a year, as a state, as a community, as a country, we've bonded over everything from big cats on TV to monoliths magically appearing in the desert. We've changed our vocabularies. We've excised phrases like, hey, let's go to an indoor rave this weekend. And we've added brand new ones like, you're on mute. We should just all admit that every one of us who one year ago was thinking about, where do I see myself in 2020? We all got that question completely wrong. But we simultaneously have a new opportunity in front of us to chart a new course for 2021. So as we close out 2020, I'd like to take a moment to thank two groups of people as we close out the year. The first are the hundreds upon hundreds of people that each and every one of you who is watching today don't get to see. The hundreds of people across the state of Maine who are working tireless hours to keep all of us safe from COVID. Many of them are here at the Maine CDC and at the Maine Department of Health and Human Services, working as epidemiologists and public health nurses and public health emergency preparedness folks delivering PPE and folks who are working at our laboratory running the samples that we talk about. Many of them are all across the state. Our colleagues in healthcare who are on the front line at hospitals, our colleagues who are EMS clinicians who are continuing their daily runs, our colleagues who are healthcare providers across the state who have kept their practice doors open, notwithstanding the pandemic. Each and every one of these groups has and continues to do their part to keep all of us safe. And even though you may not see them on screen three times a week, 
we are here today, we are here three times a week to talk about the work that is being done in Maine because of them. The work that we report on, on outbreak investigations, testing numbers, vaccinations, PPE deliveries, is not work that happens by accident. It happens because of the tireless dedication of literally hundreds, if not thousands of people across the state, all of whom who are working to keep everyone safe from COVID. The only way that Commissioner Lambrew and I are able to join you and talk about all of those things is because of the work that all of those individuals are doing every single day. And as we close out the year, I'd like to take a moment to thank each and every one of them. They have all worked tireless hours this year and they deserve all of our thanks as a state. The other group I'd like to thank are each and every one of you. As I mentioned a moment ago, from the first days of the pandemic, we have asked every one of you to make fundamental changes to the way that you go about your lives in new and significant ways. And one of the questions that I was asked quite a bit over the summer was, why is Maine doing comparatively better than virtually every other state? And my answer without fail was because, it, uh, because of Maine people themselves. When asked to change the way that they go about their lives in service of the pandemic, to make sure that all of us were staying safe, when we asked, Maine people responded. And for that, I'd like to take a moment to thank each and every one of you for sticking with us and making these difficult changes in your lives. We are very clearly aware of the challenge that these changes have made. They have meant you have not seen family. They have meant that you have not celebrated anniversaries. They have meant that your kids' birthday parties and graduation celebrations may have to be deferred till next year. But everyone should know that the sacrifices that all of us made will pay dividends. Indeed, they already have. But perhaps no one has thanked you for those sacrifices that you have all made. And so again, as we close out the year, I'd like to take a moment to thank every single one of you for the hard work that you've put in. We recognize how hard it is, but it's equally important for you to know the benefits that it has had. And so from all of us who are working on the pandemic, I'd like to take a second to thank you. 2021 will undoubtedly present different and just as challenging situations as 2020 did. But as we work through those challenges, I know and my entire team knows that we will have the support as well as the buy-in from each and every one of you. And for that, we are optimistic that 2021 will be the year in which Maine starts returning to that path toward normalcy. So with that, I'd like to close out this year of 2020 briefings. I believe that this was our 147th briefing. So I'd like to thank all of you for sticking with us, from taking time out of your days to hear the facts of where we are. We pledge to continue doing the same thing in 2021. One of the things that I've always asked everyone to do at the end of these briefings is to please be kind and take care of one another. And if, if, if the recent experience of 2020 is any guide, 2021 will be a year in which everyone across Maine continues that tradition. So with that, I look forward to seeing everyone in 2021 to continue the COVID-19 conversation. As always, please be kind, take care of one another, and please call your mother before the end of the year. Thank you.